<coughs> and welcome to my digital contribution for this conference. First, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present our research work and to put this important topic on the map. My name is Thomas Berg, and I work as an associate professor at the UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. I am also a member of the genetics group in the Forensic Medicine Commission of Norway, the Netzmedicinske Commission. In addition, I work at the University Hospital in Tromsø doing molecular cancer diagnostics and also some research. So today, I will present that what we have been doing here in Tromsø on forensic DNA phenotyping and what has been our approach for evaluating such methods for predicting human appearance based on crime scene DNA. As you know, in the field of forensic genetics, we do analysis of biological evidence. This can, for instance, be traced evidence left at the crime scene. We do a biochemical characterization and we also do, do microscopic investigation of the samples. And this is to characterize what kind of material is, is in the stain. Is it blood, is it semen, or is it saliva? The next step is to prepare a DNA profile from that samples, given that it actually contains DNA. The DNA profile is of course to identify possible source of the stain. As you know, this profile represents variable non-coding parts of the DNA, and it's been used to compare to profiles either from specific suspects or to search in national or even international DNA databases. But for a number of cases, there is no match in the regular DNA profile. And that brings us over to the new technologies where we do expanded genetic analysis. So the basic concept of DNA phenotyping is to <clears throat> analyze genetic markers in the, in, the, in the sample. And from there, see if we can extract information about a person visible tra traits, a phenotype from this sample. And can this help to identify the person who left that trace? In Tromsø, we, has, we have a um, focus on the most established of these traits, which is hair color, eye color, and also ancestry information from stain analysis. The new technologies that open up this possibility is based on massive parallel sequencing, or MPS. It is also referred to as NGS, next generation sequencing in some cases. Using this technology, we go from the situation we have now, where we do conventional DNA profiling, where we can maybe do 16 to 30 markers in one analyze, and only analyze variation in length. We use the so-called short tandem repeats, the STR markers. Going from there to massive parallel sequencing, we can now analyze hundreds or even millions of markers in one analysis. It is also possible to analyze the whole genome of, of, from the person who left the trace. And we are not restricted only to the SDR markers, we can also do other types of markers. In this respect, the single nucleotide polymorphisms, S and Ps, is of extra relevance. So we go from a situation from where we see We have a few markers and just one kind of markers. We can analyze other types of markers. We can analyze additional SDR markers on the Y chromosome and the X chromosome. And we can also do S and P typing to try to predict the phenotype 
from the markers and also the ancestry of, the, of a person based on, on genetic markers. In Chomsky, we have established this system. It's the Berrigan forensic system, which is tailor-made for forensic analysis using NPS. We have established a biobank in Tromsa, collecting samples from, from around 700 persons, which we have analyzed on this system. Our goal has been to establish, to validate, even improve, and maybe even implement this technology for casework analysis. So in the, for this biobank, we have had volunteers, persons who has been giving blood, so we have DNA from them. We have collected information about the eyes, the hair color, the height of the person, the age of the person, the color of the skin of the person, and <clears throat> even information about the ancestry of, this, of these volunteers. This is now part of a PhD project where our student, Nina Mjörsvik Salvo, is doing her project on. And today I will present some results from this project. An important requirement for using new method is that it's reliable, and that we can trust the measurements that we are doing. So the first thing that we have been doing is a technical, is an evaluation of the technical performance of this system. And our, what we have found so far is that it's very reproducible. We can rely technically on the results. It also seems to be very sensitive. It requires very little DNA. We can do a full genetic profiling of, from as very little DNA, maybe down to 10 to 20 cells. And looking at the SDR results, the, the conventional DNA profile, this is very accurate. We get the same results when we use the NPS technology as when we use the, the, the standard old uh, conventional uh, uh, profiling methodology. We also see that when we do the SNP analysis for ancestry and DNA, DNA phenotyping, that we can only, that this only works on, on back samples that are not from mixed samples. So there can't be then DNA from more than one person in, in, in the sample. That is often a challenge for, for casework samples. We also learned that the analysis is more complex and the costs are higher compared to standard DNA, DNA, DNA typing. And I think most people agree on that it will be a while until this methodology replaces the conventional DNA typing. The central research question of this project has been to determine how reliable are the DNA phenotypic predictions. In the very again system that we have been using, is a built-in software that estimates the likelihood for a distinct feature. So it gives an estimation in likelihood from 0 to 1, or from 0 to 100%. And we see here the results from analysis of one single person. And from this, the results here, we see that this person most likely has blue eyes. Sorry blue eyes. The hair color is most likely blonde, but it's also quite high value for brown hair. Coming to the ancestry uh, predictions, this person is clustered in the reference population that is in the system uh, from Europe. There are three different uh, populations that has been uh, that is in the system, European, Africa, and Asia. This person is mostly of, most likely of European ancestry. We see here a picture of the eye. So it's the, the 
prediction of the eye color was quite correct for this person. Let me see the full face, face picture of Gunhage Olsen, who is working on the forensic genetics. We see that the hair color is not exactly what was predicted. And this is, of course, because Gunhage has been staining her hair. Looking at the um, ancestry, we see that the European ancestry seems to be a correct predictions. Looking more into the eye and hair color prediction, we have been using the Hirisplex S system, which has been developed and is available on the net. It's the group of Susanna Welch that has been doing this. So we have analyzed in total 519 persons. 71 persons of the, this, 71 of these had, had brown eyes. And all of these persons were predicted to have brown eyes. We see some examples here, three persons. These are the picture of the eye, their eyes, and this is the, the prediction value. So brown eyes, if you have a brown eye, it's usually as, uh, predicted to be correctly brown. The same goal if you have blue eyes. We have 269 persons with blue eyes in, in the biobank, and 258 of these were predicted to have blue eyes. However, what has been challenging to predict correctly is the persons who have something in between blue and brown eyes, what we call intermediate eye, intermediate eye color. And actually quite a large fraction of the, of the samples in our biobank are of intermediate phenotype, 179. And in this system, we're unable to predict, predict any of this to be most likely intermediate eye color. So it is a major challenge for the system to correctly uh, estimate the eye color of persons with intermediate uh, color of their eyes. So in total, based on our uh, biobank, we were only able to correctly, uh, uh, correctly predict 63 persons, 63 percent of, of, the, of the persons with correct eye color. And this is of course due to that very, a lot of the persons have intermediate eye color. This tells us that there might be a good reason to look for new markers that could be uh, used for the North European population. And we have a project in collaboration with, with the Danish group to see if there are other markers that can help to predict the intermediate eye colors more precisely. We also see that they are very challenging to, to define the correct cat categories for eye color. Blue eyes and brown eyes are easy to predict, but the ones in between that is very hard to find and to categorize. So it might be that we will end up with having two categories, mostly blue eyes or mostly brown eyes. When it comes to hair color, this the prediction, correct prediction rate was 86%, which is quite good. The problem is, of course, that a lot of people change the hair color. What about ancestry? How, does, how good does that perform on this system? So we have evaluated three different uh, software tools for prediction of ancestry in our project. We use the forensic system, which is part of the, the Lumen for the Virgin sequencing instrument. Using this system, we actually got a quite good prediction. 93% of the uh, samples were predicted with the correct ancestry, of European ancestry. We also evaluated the Frog KB, which is, has been developed at the Yale University by Kid et al. Using this system, and uploading reference populations from, from, uh, from our biobank, we got a, a correct prediction rate of 
The last system that we have predicted was the Geno Geographer, which has been developed in Denmark. Also here we uploaded reference population from, from our biobank. And that also gave a very good prediction of ancestry. So we can conclude that the ancestry predictions are actually quite uh, accurate, at least when it comes to, to the population that we have been studying. So my last slides is on possibilities and challenges. The possibilities are going through the new methods, how they can uh, uh, make, provide investigative tool a tool for the police. Ancestry might be the most powerful of these measurements, but other people are also working on other traits. And of course, combining such analysis with genealogy studies might be very powerful. There are a number of challenges which we will be discussing. As I've been through today, there might be wrong or inaccurate measurements that we provide. Privacy is, of course, a concern. This is sensitive information. Uh, and also, may, some of the markers may even uh, overlap with disease markers. Ancestry may lead to stigmatization of groups. And of course, this methodology might be misused by governments. And here is the staff at the Center of Forensic Genetics which has been contributed all of them to this project. Thank you for your attention.